Hi, everyone, and welcome to The X, a podcast from inside Silicon Valley about how experience shapes everything from products to businesses to entire industries. I'm Brian McLean, and I'm here with Demetrius Madrigal. You're upset. Upset? He means angry. This is the third time that you've come to me for more money. All right, listen. I was talking to Vince, Eric. See, I know they didn't teach you about budgets in spaghetti and meatballs class. Vinny has been on sets before, so I expected more from him. I told you he was going to yell at me. Yeah, but he's yelling about me. What'd you spend the money on anyway? I mean, I know it wasn't on Turtle and Craft Services. You like the new spelled frame, huh? You look like Karen Carpenter. <laughs> what did I tell you when I gave you $100 million? What did we tell you? You agreed to not go over. We told you it wasn't enough. But you agreed to not go over. Because you said I couldn't direct unless we agreed. That was a clip from Entourage about uh, Vince and the guys arguing with Ari, who is a super agent, about budgets and everything that happens in Hollywood. So today we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're also going to talk about some hot topics in the news. And then also something I saw in the sky the other night. Was it aliens? Was it something else? We'll get into it. Good morning, D. How you doing? Good. Uh, we are probably not going to talk about aliens in uh, congressional testimony because it's to me. I look at it. I'm like, that's that's not meaningful. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Any more well, not yet. Not until they come and visit us. Well, I'm like, who who uses the term biologics? Biologics is a class of medications. You would say organism, right? If you're in biology or anything like that, that's just like. A, a made up term for they could be talking about like oh we had like a uh we we had a uh a, a meteorite fall to earth that had some bacteria on it and it would meet the definition easily yeah exactly but anyways we'll get into that at the end of the podcast i'll tell I'll tell you what i saw in the sky and it kind of kind of it was crazy kind of blew my mind it was an interesting experience but first uh let's talk about what's happening in the news that's what this podcast is about today kind of dialing back into some of the hot topics. Um, let's talk about Twitter. Well, Twitter is no longer Twitter, right? It's now X. <laughs> it's um, still Twitter. Without, They're just calling it X now. <laughs> not without issues or controversies. No, they're formally changing it. I, I checked. It's actually being formally changed to X. So Twitter will yeah. be gone before we know it. It's still Twitter. It's just called X. Just like it's still Facebook. They call it Meta. It's just a rebrand. It's not a changing of the identity of the company. Like all of the same leadership and uh, and ownership and stuff from when it was most recently called Twitter is still there. It's still the same platform, still the same user base, if probably smaller, um, still the same business plan for the most part until he spins it off into something more insane. It's just a rebrand. <laughs> I don't know. You sound so grumpy about all this. Uh, it's completely ridiculous. It's, it's, uh, it is the most valuable thing left about Twitter uh -huh. was the brand and the name. And it's the thing that was like, all right, well, if you sell this, then whoever is going to take it on um, is going to say, okay, well, I'm getting the brand out of it. I can build from there. Now you're getting rid of the brand, which is the high, again, the highest value. Absolutely. For this, like, well, I mean, I can't. Here's the thing: when, when we named our podcast the X, is because it's short for the experience. Within our industry, UX user experience is a very common term, so it makes sense. For like, it has a representation; it means something. For him, just calling it X, it means nothing, and it's like it's just like it's brand X from back in the day, right? It's like yeah. it's this empty placeholder, and I have no, it makes no sense. There's no upside to this. Yeah. I, so I, this all comes from his, his obsession with the letter X. Um, so like, uh, you know, obviously his previous company was called X.com, which was the, mm -hmm. which turned into PayPal, right? Cause he sold yep. it. Uh, because with Peter, much better Peter name than X. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> it is a better name, PayPal. I like it. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, so that was X.com, X. And then he recently started XAI, which is his AI company that is going to be very tightly linked to quote unquote Twitter, also now mm -hmm. called X. So he started X Corp, which is the corporation that's going to have kind of the overarching corporation. So there's going to be X Corp and underneath X Corp is going to be X, which is formerly Twitter. And then under there is going to be XAI and then anything else that goes into it. Um, and that's going to be its own major corporation there. So I think um, from his perspective, if I had to take a guess and put my business hat on for a minute, 
I think he understands that the Twitter version or portion of this new corporation is going to be the least valuable and probably the artificial intelligence group that he's building from people who came from DeepMind and from you know, uh, open AI and all that kind of stuff that they're building their own, uh, you know, language models and all this kind of stuff will probably outvalue the Twitter stuff. And eventually he can write that down or just integrate it as like some small portion or use it as a data set to feed the, the AI. So, um, I think he's trying to find a way to kind of weave it all together and create a big, more valuable company to get its investors their money back and also kind of compete in the market with, uh, the new trend of building uh, large language yeah. models and using those. So there, there's a there's a master plan I think here, and, and part of that master plan is doing exactly what you were basically saying, which is figure out a way to squash all that debt and money that was spent on on an application that's basically shrinking and probably worth I don't know maybe even less than ten billion, maybe five billion at this point. Yeah, I think it's I think it's probably in the order of five billion. I I, I think. If you, we we should probably do a whole podcast on just rebranding because there are there are reasons why you rebrand. One of them, uh, which would make much more sense in this case, and there are, are ownership reasons why he can't, would be moving it into an ownership group like what uh, Alphabet did with what Google did when they spun out Alphabet as like their holdings group that owned Google and Waymo and the other brands, and Meta did with or Facebook did with Meta by by spinning it out and now. Meta is the is the holding group that owns Facebook and Instagram and now Threads, so that would make sense if you had X Corp as the holding group that owns Twitter and Twitter is still its own brand and it owns uh, whatever his AI company is called and and um, all these other things that are going to integrate and try to create his his uh, his Omni app or whatever he wants to call it that that nobody's going to use, um, then. But it makes no sense to just say, oh, hey, this brand, which is actually one of the better names and one of their better brands out there when it comes to social, is now going to be called X, which says nothing about social. It has a completely unknown, like it, everybody's making fun of it. The brand value is is decreasing dramatically. It, it It's completely nonsensical. Yeah. Well, I mean, so... <sighs> And this is when Threads is coming in and eating their market share. And Threads is cooled off, which is normal, right? Yeah. They have a, a little honeymoon period, and now they're going to slowly drip out new features until it's much more full featured and, and a full blown competitor. But like, it's the the timing is absolutely horrible. And the way he did it seemed like he just like he got high in, at the middle of the night and just decided to tweet it at three a.m. and then caused everybody around him to scramble in order to get behind it. Yeah. So what's interesting about this is that, um, like, I believe that Facebook switched to Meta because they were trying to run away from the negativity of the Facebook name, right? Mm -hmm. Facebook itself is, has a bad reputation, very bad, and um, and has for a really long time. And switching over to Meta and focusing more on their Meta it, um, endeavors, which didn't really work out or hasn't worked out yet, um, has allowed them to basically kind of like make people almost forget about the things that were happening with Facebook and privacy and all that kind of stuff. And now that he moved into threads, which, Hey, to Mark Zuckerberg's credit, he's really good with social, right? Like all the mm -hmm. things he's done with social have been pretty successful things outside of social have been a challenge for them. Um, but the Twitter one is one that really blew my mind because it's, it's, it's a worldwide brand that everybody mm -hmm. knows and if you love the X, why not change it to Twitter X? So it'd be like, okay, this is the new Twitter. We're starting with this. It's Twitter X. It's part of the yeah. X Corp. You know what I mean? And leave the name in there so that, you know, everyone can see it, know it worldwide. Uh, like you said, you know, he did it in the middle, made the announcement. I think it was like at three o'clock in the morning. Um, he tends to make these big decisions like this. I, I would be surprised if it was never discussed at all. Maybe it was only discussed lightly and then he made that decision, but I'm surprised it also didn't come from the actual CEO of the company. He's not the CEO of the company. The CEO is yeah. a new person that he hired, right? And so it almost seems like even though she's uh, in charge and her name is slipping my mind right now, uh, he's just continuing to do what he does, which is take the reins and make large decisions and everyone else has to kind of, kind of figure it out. Yeah. And that's not without some other issues that just came up. So I want to talk about these because it's really interesting because we live near San Francisco and, and we're kind of seeing this all happen in real time. So he tried to have the Twitter um, 
name taken off the side of the building in San Francisco, which is fine. You could do that. More than happy to do that. But you have to get a permit from the city for a very specific reason, because the whole area has to be taped off. And they usually put police officers there to make sure that when the sign is being taken off the side of the building, if they drop it on accident or anything like that happens, it doesn't hurt any pedestrians, smash any cars or cause any damage. Yep. You did it without a permit. And so in the middle of having it done, the police showed up and said like, hey, you can't do this. You have to tape this off. You need to get a permit. So they just kind of were just figuring they were above the law and just doing this without that. So that got stopped. And mm. then they um, decided to erect a large X on the roof and light it up. Now they stated that it was for an event, but it was flashing and apparently it's flashing into all these neighbors' houses. Oh, yeah. And so they already filed, um, the neighbors already filed 24 complaints with the, uh, with the uh, building department and the building department sent over uh, permit officers to come and check things out and were denied. The inspectors were denied access to the roof multiple times stating that it was for an event and they did not need it. Um, and so now there is a fight between Twitter and the city because the city does have the right to come in and do an unannounced visit or an announced visit uh, when it comes to safety and inspections and things like that. So it's it's kind of messy. Don't know why you wouldn't just talk to the city and get a permit in no time at all and get this stuff squared away. It feels very like uh, like a power move and a power yeah. move that didn't work because they're basically getting their, their hands slapped. Um but like, why do we even need all this theater at this point? This feels like the '90s all over again. Th this is what we did when when the dot com boom was happening. Is all the companies did crazy stuff. I remember airplanes flying over, banners making fun of competitors at events in San Francisco. I mean, I was in an event in Las Vegas where there was a like a live newscast, and some of the People that worked at our company were talking about how other companies were having uh, their mascots of their companies dress up and run in front of all the cameras. And it was just like this nuttiness and craziness in the 90s. And it feels like he's trying to bring some of that back. But nowadays, people, you know, it's a different culture. Like people aren't into that as much, you know? Well, it's it's also like people forget so San Francisco isn't really part of Silicon Valley. It's it's a different culture. Than, and what happened, there's really not that many large tech companies that are headquartered there. Not a, a lot of startups are really successful startups are actually started there. Most of them might start in Silicon Valley and then move up there at some point. Yep. But like there's, there's one of the reasons why you saw those protests around buses and things because they, it's not the same. Like Silicon Valley, people are there to work and, and for their career and to, and for advancement. And in, in San Francisco, it's a little bit more about having some fun and getting out for a concert or, a, or, a, a, or getting out to bars for happy hours and stuff like that. It's a bit different. And they're not, they're not as into kind of what the tech provides. And then when you get into, this is Twitter we're talking about where uh, any most of the, of the goodwill went out the window with all of the massive layoffs where he hasn't paid severance. It's uh, the I think that the sentiment for that company is really really at a low point. And we even talked about some of the other things involved, such as they don't own the copyright or the uh, the trademark for 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 X when it comes to social. That's owned by Meta, and for the same thing with. Uh, the trademark for gaming that's on for Microsoft with their Xbox and things. So X is not available to him from a, uh, from a trademark perspective and the logo that he used, he, he made the announcement and said, Oh, Hey, whoever on people on Twitter, give me a logo. Cause I don't have one. And then he ended up with this basic Unico Unicode logo of an X that is apparently being used by DJs around the world and stuff. And it's just a complete, complete like it it feels to me like you got really high and decided oh hey wouldn't this be a great idea this thing i tried like in the 90s i want to bring it back and he was surrounded by like these yes men who were just like oh yeah we'll, we'll make it happen and it's been it's just like horrible for the product and for the company and for the brand is it makes no sense again i keep saying that but it, it's it's just, i can't get past it it feels like an episode of Silicon Valley, the show. It, it feels almost fake that all these things are happening. Like, oh, we're picking the wrong logo. We're not 
you know, we're not uh, getting rights to things. We're, you know, it's very much startup y, which is tripping over your feet, making huge mistakes, trying to get things repaired and fixed. And, and who knows, maybe shake it all up at the very end. It will be X and they'll have its own special trademark or whatever it is. And the lawyers can find it out for the next decade. But like, uh, it's see, very like interesting. Comparison to Silicon Valley, the TV show is charitable. To me, it feels like an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's been a nutty time, and and uh, I don't know. I mean, I think we got more ahead of us. We'll see, you know, what happens. I mean, currently, there's no way that this this company is valued at what it used to be, and and maybe when it blends together the XAI, the artificial intelligence, with Twitter, with everything, maybe one day they can get back to where yeah you know, where they want to be with it and stuff like that. But I think it's going to be a long journey. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see what partnerships he's able to establish over time, because if he's feeding, like, let's say, an AI system with Twitter data and vice versa and trying to use, you know, AI in order to help run Twitter and stuff like that, who knows what's going to pop out at the other side, on the other side, right? So and he, and, and you, be, being in his- Can you detail what the experience was? You, you used WeChat, which is kind of the model for this kind of super rep kind of thing. Uh-huh. Can you can you describe for for everyone kind of what your experience was with it? And what Elon uh, I thought it was pretty- to get to? It was- Pretty good. So basically, WeChat is this idea uh, in China. It's used in China mostly. I mean, I have it. You could download it here and stuff like that and look at it. But like, um, it's mostly used in China. And the idea is is that you have what's called a super app, and the super app will have all the things that you would use throughout your day um, to kind of run your day from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed in order to uh, manage your day. Like, for example, you can chat with friends on it. You can call a car to come pick you up. You can make payments at uh, the stores and other places. You can pay for things. You can share money with friends if you're splitting dinners. But it's all done under one app. And it works well in in China. And like Dee had mentioned uh, when we were talking offline is that, well, that makes sense because you have like this country with a ton of people and kind of a, a different culture where basically they're kind of dictated in some ways of like what applications you should use or what technology you should use. The theory behind it is pretty is pretty solid in the sense of like if everything's under one roof and it's all integrated and has a really amazing user experience, then it just makes for a smooth transition between services throughout the day and makes your life a little bit easier. This is something so, that a lot of companies have talked about trying to do, the super app. This has been mm-hmm. a conversation for the last three or four years about like, okay, well, we have an Uber and we have a Stripe and we have a, a Square and uh, it's not Square anymore, right? It's Block. We have block. a Block and we have this, can't we bring them all under one roof and create this really big, humongous company that has that type of integration? And I think that's what well, Elon wants to do. He's mentioned it before. Yeah, I, I I can see that. My counter, and we had this conversation before, is that these companies will tend not to do as well in some of those categories than a company who's specifically based on uh, focused on that. And if you look at kind of like where we are now, we can accomplish a lot of this stuff through APIs and plugins and things like that. Like if I go and I get an Uber or a Lyft, I can pay with Google Pay. And if you're on an Apple device, you could probably just pay with Apple Pay and it's pretty seamless. Uh so I think that there's a little bit what what the Google and Apple don't have is the social aspect. And the reason for that is because it's really hard. Google tried social before Apple's never really tried it. Um, and it's it's not really the case that you can just throw money at something and make it work. You have to have the right culture behind it in order to develop it. And yeah. like we said before, culture is kind of destiny. But I don't know that. All of that stuff aside about how hard it is to develop it and experience that's going to be better than just individual companies who specialize in those things and kind of allowing interoperability. There's still the the way in which Elon is going about it, where he's just starting with AI. He's going to have to rebuild with social. He hasn't even really started with payments yet. And all of these other things, he's kind of like putting himself behind the, if he had a lot of this stuff already developed and then he bought uh, and then he bought Twitter and integrated that under kind of like an, an overarching kind of uh, holding company and they were all interoper- interoperable. That would make more sense. But there's a reason why Jack Dorsey owned Square, now Block, and never did it because it's not the easiest thing in the world. 
And we know from the work that we've done in social and metaverse and stuff that people who are going to a place for something social don't necessarily want a financial component to it. Yeah, it's it's a complicated thing to stitch together. I, I would tell you that the Super App already exists in the United States. It's called the Apple iPhone and it's called the Android <laughs> phone. No, it's yeah. true. The Android it and is, Apple phones. Because if you think about it, right? That is the true super app, right? It's in your pocket. Mm-hmm. You pick it up. You know, I, I was using Apple Pay the other day and it kind of blew my mind like how easy it is. It's like, you know, I wanted to buy some some food and it said, you just click on Apple Pay and then instantly it just charges to your account. It's so simple. I did the same thing on an Android phone phone at one point where, you know, you, uh, through Google, how you could just quickly select your credit card and pay. It's like between that and the ability to jump into threads or Twitter and then out of threads and Twitter and then onto something else and search and everything, Really, the phone is the super app, but everybody yeah. wants it to built into a software component. But at the end of the day, who owns the software component? Really, who's the master of it? <laughs> it's the person who manufactures the hardware that goes in your pocket. So, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's it's fun to watch all this unfold. I, I think to some extent, I think he could pull some of this stuff off, but I think it's just going to be a smaller company than maybe he anticipates. That, that's, yeah. That would be my guess. You know, I, I'm actually seeing a splintering, right? It's like, there's so many social apps now. Now there's so, now there's, you know, um, so many financial apps. It's like, and, and you talk to people and they all use different things, right? You talk to them and mm-hmm. you're like, Oh, what do you use? And they're like, Oh, I use, you know, chime. The other person says they use, you know, uh, PayPal. It's like, it's all over because there's so many competitors and because there's plenty of room for everyone. I mean, there's 8 Mm -hmm. billion people on earth, right? And was it something like in the United States, 98% of the people in the United States have a phone in their pocket and the majority of them are smartphones. So it's like, okay, there's a big population of people that we can, that we can sell to. So I I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it unfolds, but I think we should move on to our next topic because you had mentioned something when you said, I I, 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 I have a prediction for this though. Um, I think that this, what he's doing, the way he's doing is ultimately from a, from logistics and user base and strategy standpoint is ultimately going to crash and burn. And then he's going to have to sell off Twitter at a massive loss uh, to somebody who can try to use it because he, he's not the sole owner. He has investors. He has people that he's answerable to, and he's going to try to kind of run roughshod over them. And we might see some court actions and things in response because he's, potentially acting in bad faith. I imagine that a lot of the investors who went in with him in order to buy Twitter are not very happy with him and how he's handling things. Mm. Um, But I don't think this is going to be a success. I think there might be some things that come out of the individual companies that are successful. Like uh, Neuralink might have some things when it comes to like implants for people who are, who are uh, uh, neurologically damaged, who might have maybe like who are, paraplegics or quadriplegics can help them, which would be great. This should be fantastic. But I don't think that his master plan for bringing these together is is going to work out. And I think part of that is just the way in which we know how it is with payments, right? With anything financial, there's so much trust involved. And Mm -hmm. I think that he's burned through all of the goodwill and all of the trust that he could potentially have for the vast majority of the public. Yeah. I have a different prediction. Mine's, uh, I'll give it to you now if you want it. But yeah, go for it. my prediction is, is that X Corp is going to have XAI, Twitter, or X, and potentially something else underneath it. And I think over time, those other things, the non-Twitter ones, are going to grow, and they're going to get bigger, and they're going to do quite well, um, because they're more in his wheelhouse. And then he's going to write down the loss of Twitter. Yeah, I, th- I think we're I think we're actually kind of saying the same thing in different words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. when he sells yeah. it a loss, it's going to be a huge write down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and if he takes it public, uh, if X Corp becomes uh, a public company, you'll look at the you'll look at the financial sheets, the and I mean the financial balance sheet and everything, and it'll kind of show things like the Twitter and the AI and all that stuff. You're going to see everything else massively doing well, like AI and all that stuff. And then you'll see the Twitter thing as being the thing that slowly over time is being written down. Right. It's just so a you- it's just a thought. So right now, X Corp is just Twitter. It doesn't include the AI uh, spinoff or the tunneling spinoff or any of these other things or Neuralink. Do you envision that, and SpaceX? Do you think they're all going to come um, under that kind of single ownership group? No, or a no, no, no. company? Or no, nope. okay. no, no. So SpaceX. Here, here's my prediction: uh, SpaceX will stay as SpaceX. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. Starlink. Will start. Will come out as its own company, 
Mm-hmm. X Corp will have X underneath it, and then eventually X AI will be blended into it, and it'll be like this whole AI social thing. Is um, somebody, and, called, somebody named the AI company is X AI? Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> so so and it's work. It says states in there working closely with Twitter. Sure. So basically, those two companies are going to like partner and work together, and th- and they actually got some quite a quite a lot of good people too from DeepMind and yeah. other places. I think the I think the the challenge with that company is really just the timing that they are kind of starting from a point where they're behind relative to everybody else, and I don't know what their resources look like. I don't think but it matters, it, D. I think it's way I, too early. All this stuff is so early. Like like well, AI stuff. Know. I mean, we're in the we're in the beginning phases. I mean, we're 20, 30 years from now. We'll still be talking about these companies and the and things that they're I doing. I, th- I think Google and uh, OpenAI have such a head start, and they're such well resourced companies at this point, especially Google, that it's going to be difficult. I mean, even ChatGPT is dependent on transformers that were invented by Google. Yeah. So uh, they're kind of at the point. Where I don't know where they are. They've got you know a, a CEO that is. Uh, I assume that Elon is, I assume that Elon's the CEO because he tends to be the CEO, even if he's not the CEO, um, that they are, you know, how long is it going to take for them to kind of move along? Um, but at the same time, if it, if some of the companies are going to, I, I think that individual company has a chance at being successful, just like Tesla and just like mm-hmm. SpaceX. And because, um, at the end of the day, the entire company is not the CEO. And there are, I'm sure, some very smart, very hardworking, very well-meaning people within those companies who can who can uh, work within Elon's requirements in order to bring some success and do some good stuff. Absolutely. Things. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I uh, Elon and I, we think differently because <laughs> I, I, I'm very impressed with the things that he's done, honestly. Like, he's built some amazingly large I, – I wasn't able to pull it off. He He, he – built some amazingly large and amazing companies. But here's the thing. His passion, if you listen, I have watched hundreds of hours of interviews of him over the last decade. His passion really is in sustainability and like rockets and like that whole segment, right? So my Mm -hmm. question, if I was chatting with him, my one question to him would be, from a business perspective, you have the opportunity to focus on SpaceX and Tesla, the two things that you're extremely passionate about, put all your time and effort into them. And because of the amount of resources you have financially, you could have just invested in all of these companies, like invested into artificial intelligence, invested into the Neuralink, wasn't started by him, right? It was created by someone else, Uh, invested in all these companies. What is the value to you, quote unquote, owning the company, right? It almost seems to add more stress onto you. And I know it's a control thing to some extent, like yeah, you must be able to control it. Tell. it but you can also have, and I've heard this discussed in podcasts from lawyers, you could have controlling interest. Like you could not be the CEO, mm-hmm. not run the company, but have the ability to say, no, you have to do this or that because I, of, I, you know. I don't think it's in his personality makeup. I mean, he can bring it in as CEO and let them make all the decisions like he did with uh, Linda Yaccarino at Twitter. But yeah. He hasn't done that. He named her a CEO and he kind of like shunts her off into a COO or even a CMO role, which is what I see from her a lot is just her kind of marketing his decisions. Uh, I, I don't think it's in it. I don't think it's in his psychological makeup. I don't think he can be a passive observer. I think he needs to be in control. I think there's some kind of psychological thing for him where he, I, I, to some extent, I think the Twitter thing for him is just entertainment. Like it's just, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, of course. Being, just having fun. Um, I think that at the same time, he can't come in and be a more passive role. That's one of the reasons why he named himself a founder of Tesla when he didn't found Tesla. So it's all of these factors. If he could, I think it will make a lot more sense. I make it, I think it makes it difficult for him to partner with other people who aren't under his thumb. And the ability to work together with people and work together with other companies and have these relationships with companies like Disney or Square or Apple or whoever else who are going to be better at what they do than you will ever do at being the f- at do at doing that thing, especially when it's the eighth thing that you're doing simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, that's the challenge, right? It's like only mm-hmm. so many hours in the day, right? So how how can you really have your hands in all this stuff? But uh, like, how can you be the CEO of like eight different companies simultaneously and do a great job at all of them? Yeah, 
Well, this is one for the history books for sure. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> anyone else has ever been CEO of so many companies at one time, I don't think, right? Even, even I don't know. Edison, to, maybe yes. Edison, yeah. But uh, hey, let's move on. We were talking a little bit before you were making some references to shows <laughs> and stuff. And we definitely made a reference to the show Entourage. or That, that was actually from the movie Entourage. Um, but uh, the writer strike continues and it's joined by the Actors Guild. So basically Hollywood is on pause. There is nothing being made new right now. I think there's waivers that are out for finishing up stuff that was already started before the strikes. But for the for the foreseeable future, um, not much not much is happening because they're in a kind of stalemate. Uh, that's the term for it, right? Stalemate. Mm-hmm. Um, and so interesting couple of things, though, that I learned that I, I was really like kind of marinating on. And, and, and that's it. One of the complaints also is that these body scans have been happening, which I didn't really know much about until I started researching it. And basically, you know, certain films, certain um, enterprises within Hollywood have already started these things where they're scanning the actors, scanning the extras digitally Mm -hmm. to add them into movies and shows. And it happened on uh, WandaVision. It was reported by NPR. And basically what the person was saying is, you know, have your hands out, have your hands in, look this way, look that way. Let's see a scared face. Let's see a surprised face. Like these actors were never told why they why they were doing all these digital scans which took about 15 minutes per per actor per group um for the movies and shows that they were doing and they really weren't asked permission in order to do it it was just kind of like hey this is something that we're doing under your your contract and as they're scanning them in they're basically being able to use these digital assets to fill in extras so if you don't want to pay you know what is it 178 dollars a day to have uh, an extra come on the scene and you need 10,000 of them running down a street or something, just add these in and then it costs you nothing. Um, yeah. I, uh, I don't know if this is legal under uh, laws such as GDPR and CPRA. Like the, you cannot own somebody's like uh, likeness in perpetuity. Uh, it, it makes perfect sense. I don't, if they were just using this for that specific pr- production, we're going to pay you. We're going to scan you and then we're going to use your likeness and you're for that specific production, just yep. that one. That would be make perfect sense that I think if they wanted to say, okay, well, we want to use your likeness again in this other thing. You don't have to come in and get scanned. We'll pay you X amount. You have to approve it. Uh, that I think would make sense. Uh, and you, maybe if it's uh, something that would normally get credited, then you get credited based on the rules that the, that the guilds have. But the whole point of GDPR and CPRA and some of these other privacy laws is that people that people can't own your private personal data and they can't reuse it uh, freely and you have the right to have it deleted if you want to. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was some legal action that comes along or if there was some amendment to those laws to make it clear that this applies for, for likeness rights. I think this is something that's going to need to get addressed anyway when it comes to <laughs> AI and deep fakes and things like that. Uh, it's a matter of time. And it feels like the studios to me are being a bit short-sighted in how they think they're going to be able to use AI and other people's data. I don't think that it's, you know, to, to quote, um, you know, a certain large CEO, it's not very reasonable what they are attempting to do. Yeah. You know, so uh, I just wanted to uh, mention something that was from the NPR article. It said five five background actors interviewed by NPR all said they were caught off guard in recent months by having to undergo body scans by studios, feeling they didn't have much of a choice because if they push back, they fear the risk of retaliation. Most of the actors were required to sign non-disclosure agreements. Yep. So it almost seems like they're trying to quickly... I mean, I don't know, I haven't talked to a studio, but quickly go in and scan and get everybody's digital data before any of these contracts are potentially uh, negotiated and signed. Yeah, which is, uh, I feel as though, cause it made no sense to me that the um, the production and the content strategy that they had, especially Netflix, where they were putting out like one mo- new movie or show every day, just about. It was just like, you're just flooding the the your library with things that are going to go ignored because there's too much content people can't watch that that much yeah and i think that it made even less sense when 
kind of Disney kind of overproduced and, and some of these other companies kind of overproduced a bit. And I think now looking back on it, they were getting ready for this. They wanted to like build up their reserves of content on the platform as much as possible so that when things got shut down, because they knew this was coming, everybody knew this strike was coming. They knew the contracts were coming up for renewal and they knew that they had the power to kind of uh, negotiate in, in such a way that they could avoid a strike. They very clearly chose to go ahead and let the strike happen. And I think now they're leaning on their reserves of content that they were produced and they're playing this game of chicken where they're going to say, like, we have more cash and more reserves than you. We'll operate at a loss. We can operate at a loss longer than you in order to negotiate a better deal. But I think on the other side of things, the, both the writers and the actors are not in a position where they can say, okay, well, we'll, we'll go ahead and do the work for, for what we're being paid. We'll just tighten our belts. It's more a case of like, well, if you don't agree to this, I'm just going to have to change careers. I don't really have a choice. I can't make a living on this. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, honestly, like whatever happens with a contract, it's not going to change the progression of technology. It's not going to stop mm -hmm. studios from using artificial intelligence. It's not stopping them from negotiating rights for digital scans. Like the technology is going to pl keep plowing through. It's a matter of how it's being deployed and used. And mm -hmm. what is, I don't know, what is the right way to do this? Um, I heard an interesting take that really changed my perspective, not perspective at all. I didn't really have, I was trying to stay neutral and kind of listen to both sides, but like changed my thinking, um, around it. And it was Scott Galloway on pivot. Now we always joke about like, Scott's not always right. Even at uh, one of his recent <laughs> interviews, they brought him in. They're like, he's not always right, oh, yeah. but, he makes, he, but he makes you he think. Very, very yeah. like very raw, raw about the whole Netflix content strategy that flooded the the platform with crap and ended up with uh, them posting their first user loss in, in history. Yeah, so, yeah, and, yeah, but he makes you—he makes you think, and I like people who make. Alex Scott, think. he's very smart, but at the same time, he doesn't work within these industries very much. He's kind of commenting from without outside of them, and what he said kind of made me f have the same feel. So I'll let you go ahead and kind yeah. of. So basically, here was his interesting take on it. He was like, "You have the actors, the writers, and the studios all fighting with each other, right? So mm -hmm. you know, the actors and the writers—they want you know better contracts and all that kind of stuff, and you have the studios saying." you know, no, like, like we want to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And they're all arguing on this whole thing out when this big, huge monster in the background, which is essentially large language models, large video models, large math model, all these things that are being built right now that no one even talks about, right. Um, where they need data and those tech companies that are producing that technology need data. They need movie scripts. They need uh, actors speaking, they need your voice. They need everything from you in order to be able to produce the artificial intelligence that everyone's fighting about. Instead of fighting with one another, come together with the studios, everyone come together and you go fight the biggest pocket of cash that exists. And that is essentially the tech companies that are building these technologies yeah. is you come to them and say, look, if you are going to, you literally scrape my voice, I am, you know, Robert Downey Jr. or whatever, and you're going to scrape my voice and start producing things uh, for consumers that are using my voice without my permission, you pay royalties. You're going to scrape the script of Jerry Maguire. You're going to pay a royalty. You should demand them, get the biggest law firm in the world to work with you and demand that they pay royalties every single time they use your likeness and yeah. fight the bigger threat rather than fight with one another. Since Hollywood in its own entity is this amazing creative thing and when it's all humming, it produces wonderful things that we all love. So instead, fight the technology companies and strike a partnership. Make it happen. And he and he likened it to when he was on the board of the New York Times and the New York Times basically gave away all of their content to Google and said, sure, you could put put it up on your website and you know, more people will read our stuff or whatever. And he said ultimately we were fighting internally about it because it was like, no, no, they can pay for it. They could pay for the content sure. from us in order to deliver it to consumers who and then and then Google in 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 response is making billions and billions of dollars from giving away all this stuff for free to its consumers. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I thought it was a, it really made me think about it. It's like industry versus industry rather than fighting with. Yeah. I, I don't. So I, I think it's a bad idea. And 
there, there's a very specific reason why. And because in, taking inspiration for something for creatives has always been free. It's always been something where like, okay, well, why it, it sets a precedent that if you use something as an inspiration that you have to pay royalties on it. So if you are making a gangster movie, if you are if you are uh, every time basically that, uh, that, uh, that Martin Scorsese makes a God, a God a Goodfellas type movie. He has to pay royalties to Brian De Palma for Scarface and uh, Howard Hawks' estate for for the original Scarface because Goodfellas and Casino and all those movies are basically remakes of Scarface. These are like it, it sets that kind of precedent. Um, same thing with music of like, oh hey, you used not just plagiarized my chord progression from something, but you took inspiration from it. Now we're opening that up to litigation. Um, it, I don't think you can really make a carve out for AI training when creatives have been using kind of other, other creative uh, pieces of art out there for ins- as inspiration forever. And it, it's impossible not to. So, I think it just makes things much more litigious without a lot of benefit for it. The other thing is, I don't think, I know Scott Galloway thinks it is, but personally, I don't think that 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 Silicon Valley and tech is really that interested in getting into kind of this creative game. I think they want to create the distribution tools and they don't necessarily really want to be in these businesses. I think they kind of feel like they had to because once Netflix started doing a few things on their own, all the other studios pulled their content from the Netflix platform. And mm-hmm. They didn't really have a choice. They had to like go all in and it's been not good for them. They were doing much better when they were just hosting other financially. They were doing much better um, when they were ho- doing a lot more of hosting of other people's uh, content. It's been the content creation side of things, aside from a few shows like Stranger Things that we always talk about, has I don't think been a, a big money maker for them. I think it's been very expensive. Yeah, I think I think what he's referring to mostly is this idea that like, you know, if you're creating the distribution tool, but the tool is basically grabbing your let's put an example, like you're grabbing Robert Downey Jr.'s complete voice, his real voice, right? And just mm-hmm. giving it away to everyone to use for whatever they want all the time, then it's kind of like, well, wait a minute, like that's my voice. Like that's my, my content. And I understand there's always a gray line and you can fight it out about constantly about like inspiration versus yeah. this and that. But at the end of the day, I think, or, or clips, even movie clips, right? If you're, what if you're, what if the AI, you say like, Oh, you know, what was the best scene from this movie or that movie? And then suddenly it just grabs the clip and distributes it to you. Well, that's not necessarily, you, you didn't really give permission to do so. Right. I it's like, I don't think AI can do this legally. Right. Like when, when uh, Google Maps was using Samuel L. Jackson's voice, yeah, I believe he got paid for it, or Arnold Schwarzenegger's voice he got paid for it. When exactly Disney got access to a a uh, a automated version of Jim Earl Jones's voice, so they could always be um, Darth Vader, he got paid for it. So mm-hmm. I don't know that Hollywood is taking this stuff. I don't think Silicon Valley is really interested in doing so. When it comes down to like paying extras and stuff for tech companies, this is peanuts. Like it's not even worth the headache to, to do this stuff in order to avoid paying, you know, a few extras, a hundred bucks here and there. Like that's less than we pay. That's about what we pay people to, to participate in research studies. Yeah. Like it, like I, I don't see this happening. I think he's kind of talking to a paper tiger. I think that a lot of this is coming down to, the studios and the WGA and SAG always kind of sparring with each other for generations and them kind of going along with it uh, once again. So uh, it, for me, if, if I was part of this fight, I'd be looking at, no, uh, I think that A24 res- deserves some recognition because they are in production. They haven't been shut down because they are an independent studio who has agreed to all of the demands of the, uh, the the different unions. And I think it makes a lot more sense like they did in the old days, if you can get together, you know, Martin Scorsese and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and a few other big names to come together and create a new independent studio that is operating in the ways that they, that they feel like it should be done and provide more competition to the AMTPT. 
because I think ultimately it's just this this kind of battle that they have going on. And they're going to be in India studio and there's all those things associated with it. But if you have somebody like these names, then you kind of have a certain amount of power behind it. That's one of the things that happened with, uh, with Tom Cruise and his production company is that he's, he's been able to get a lot more power and control in there. Now, uh, I think if they don't do that, this is just going to continue to whittle away at them. Like whatever negotiation that they're going to get is, it's gotten so, so negative and so uh, adversarial that it's, it's really difficult to see how this can come together and, and, and be what it was before. Yeah. Well, you kind of nailed it, which is wherever there is some sort of conflict or major change happening or fight that's going on becomes opportunity. Every single time you look back at the companies that were created in 2008 during the financial collapse, Airbnb and all these companies, right? Look at what's happening right now. Like you said, people, some studios could get together and say like, you know what, we're willing to do this and we're willing to do it exactly the way they want. And then combine two or three studios together, create a huge studio. And then 10 years from now, we look back and go, look, that's now the big studio in Hollywood, right? It's like, that's what happens when these things happen comes opportunity, right? And there might be something interesting that, that comes from it, but uh, it's definitely an interesting story to follow. Uh, some say that they may not get this thing resolved uh, for another six months or a yeah. year. And I'm like, wow, yeah, that's going to really slow things this, down. I do think this was kind of well planned. And I think that, you know, uh, the AMPTP said some statement about they want like to take uh, the benefits without assuming the risk. I mean, that's Come on, that's, that is an asinine statement. The people who are working on things, uh, who are putting their names on it, they are they are risking their career, their future. They're they're risking their livelihoods. These studios are, are risking their profitability uh, on an earnings call for a couple quarters. Like the 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 nature of the risk is completely different. Just ask uh, anybody who worked on Pluto Nash. That like that buried a lot of careers. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's move on to our next, uh, our next and final topic is just a quick one, but we thought it was really interesting. Uh, is uh, Lenovo is rumored to be building a Steam Deck competitor called the Legion Go, which I was wondering when this was going to happen. You know, Steam Deck has gotten a lot of press and has had many years uh, of, of excitement and run up um, to this moment where now you might start seeing some, some competitors out there. What do you, what did you find out about it? Uh, so it is a new, the n- the latest release in this new category of kind of more fully featured gaming handset handhelds are not like the, the Game Boys and the PS Vitas of the past where you can play like, you know, uh, scaled down versions of, of games. These are like full blown console games that are, they can be played in your hand. Nintendo kind of kicked this off and I think we can kind of an- anticipate them getting further involved. It's about ready for a refresh, refresh of the Switch. So the Steam Deck came along, and unlike Nintendo Switch, they they just used a PC architecture inside of a handheld box. We also had the Asus release their version of this, called the the ROG Ally, um, ROG Republic of Gamers Ally. Uh, Lenovo is going to have one out, and because it is newer, every time you see a newer release, it's going to have uh, better specs and better hardware inside it. So Lenovo is going to have an eight inch display. I assume it's going to be an uh, active matrix OLED and it's going to have AMD's new Phoenix processor, which is specifically designed for these kinds of systems, which uh, Steam Deck and the, and the, uh, uh, the Asus machines both have mm-hmm. older processors uh, based on the Zen 1 architecture, I believe. Uh, this, I think, it really gets into uh, the reason why this is so big and the reason why the Switch was so big is that it really gets into a need within the user experience. And that is to be able to play full blown AAA, like uh, f- serious, uh, complete titles wherever you want, whenever you want, not have to, uh, if you're living in a household or, or uh, a wife and kids or with your parents or whoever else, you don't have to negotiate for who has control over the TV. You don't have to spend, you know, thousands of dollars on a gaming PC and build it out and have a space for it. Um, you can actually, just pick it up, play it wherever you want, plug it into something else, ideally have additional support. Um, and it's kind of, we've talked about in a, in a previous gaming podcast about the tyranny of hardware where like, all right, well, you've got to get this machine that, that works well on some game, some machines work better for, for uh, some games that are CPU based versus other games that are GPU based. And then, 
NVIDIA and AMD did some crazy stuff with how they're distributing uh, GPUs and and crypto got involved and it's been a whole mess. If you can kind of get away from that and let people to kind of engage with games where they want, how they want, um, without the limitations they've had before, it's a, it's a significant improvement on the user experience. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, giving people what they want, basically like on the go, AAA games and stuff like that. I think it's amazing. It just it's just interesting uh, that it's not coming from the major players like Microsoft with the Xbox, right? Like maybe they're going, oh, now we're going to create a yeah. handheld version or whatever. It's interesting that it's coming from these smaller uh, companies. I mean, Lenovo is a pretty big company, but it, it's in the grand scheme of things, it's a, it's a little bit of a smaller company. But you know what? This is how it usually works. A lot of these bigger companies tend to observe and see what happens in, in a, acquiring one of these companies, bringing it in, and then trying to build like the quote unquote final version, you know, the, the real yeah. Nintendo Switch competitor. So I think it's exciting. I like hearing stuff coming from the gaming community yeah. that's new and interesting. And Yeah, I mean, it's a Switch, it's a Steam Deck. There are some other similar stuff that is out there from smaller brands. Um, and I think we'll see more. Lenovo's been in. Uh, in gaming for a long time, I have a Le- Leno- uh, Lenovo Legion Five. It, it's great. I love it. Um, really, really well built machine. Asus has been in gaming for a long time. I think for some of the larger players, uh, and Apple's never really done very much in gaming. To the extent that they have, it's been kind of like uh, uh, reluctant. They're like, okay, well, let's some some mobile games on on like an iPad or something like that. Uh-huh. They haven't been serious into it. Uh, Microsoft has never really been a hardware producer. They've done a few things with Surface and Surface Books and um, Xbox, but they've never really been like what you know the history. They don't have the history of an of a Nintendo or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we're going to see more. I think we're going to see some from from uh, from MSI. I think we're going to see some from uh, other. Uh, gaming companies that are out there. I think Epic might get involved at some point. Um, and I think that it's there. These are also going to interface with the uh, streaming gaming platforms like, you know, <laughs> formerly known as Stadia. Yeah. I don't even know what position that's in now, but like uh, Lenovo has their own version of that called Legion Play. There's Logitech G Cloud. Asus has something uh, in that vein. Um, so does and so does Sony and Microsoft. So I think that when you take these systems that are really well built from an ergonomic and kind of from a fundamental standpoint, and then you can add in remote support, um, so that as the technology and the games continue to improve, that you're not as left behind. You don't have you don't have this like oh now I have to pay another seven eight hundred dollars in order to just continue to play the newest games that are up, then it's kind of, you can kind of see an ecosystem coming together. Absolutely. Yeah. No, this is, this is exciting. And this is kind of a fun topic too. It's not a, (laughs) not a depressing topic like some of the other ones, (laughs) right? It's like, it's just, it's just fun to see how things come out. I'd like to try, I'd like to try it out. I actually, I held, (laughs) it's so funny. I actually held a steam deck. I played with it for a few minutes. I have a friend who has a steam deck. Um, It was pretty, it was pretty awesome. A little heavier than I thought it was going to be. Like mm-hmm. if you're holding it for a long period of time, um, but really impressed with the quality of it when I saw it. So, uh, you know, as these things progress, I think they're going to get cooler and cooler. But um, before we wrap up today, I just wanted to talk about the thing I saw in the sky. No, oh, so no. we were we were out in the woods on a, <laughs> on a trip and a couple of us were sitting outside. It was late at night. It was probably later at night, meaning it was dark. I don't remember exactly what time it was, but we were sitting on this deck and you could see all the stars. And suddenly one of the people that was on the trip with me says, oh my God, what is that? And they start pointing in the sky and everyone's like, what are you talking about? And we saw this really bright dotted line just like flying across the sky. Like it was, it was so cool to see. I actually have pictures of it and, and video. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like flying across the sky. And one of our friends that was there goes, oh, that's the, um, those are satellites. Um, those are the the new Starlink satellites. And I was like, what? And they, they apparently like two days before we were on the trip, they released 22 uh, of those of them in the sky. And when you're up in the mountains high up and it's pitch dark like that, it looks like little beads of light running across the sky, almost like, uh, what you would imagine, um, you know, Santa Claus and the reindeer would look like from a distance. Right. You know what I mean? That's Um, interesting. It was so, 
cool. It was moving so fast. At the distance they're going, it's going incredibly fast because if they're in orbit, that shouldn't look like it's uh, – that's not geosynchronous orbit for sure. They're moving faster than than the – than other satellites that are out there for sure. Oh though. yeah. I mean, it was really fast to the point where after about five minutes, it was out of our sight. Like they were, they were, it was moving across and then suddenly it was gone and we looked it up and other people around the country at different times had reported seeing it and taking pictures of it. And it was the same pictures that, you know, kind of we had, yeah. but it was super cool to see. It was really interesting and it just makes your brain kind of go like, oh my gosh, there's so much technology floating in the sky up yeah. there. I think that it's important when with all the the with all of the UFO news and aliens uh, speculation going on. People to remember, like most of the time, if you see something in the sky, it's going to tend to either be a satellite or some kind of drone, because yeah. almost any kind of like homebrew drone that drone that anybody can build at home, for example, or uh, people are putting things in space now, just like out of like kits they build in their backyard. Yep. Then. Uh, almost everything out there is going to be a UFO because yeah. there's too much stuff for everybody to know what it is. Yeah. It was an unidentified flying object because mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I didn't identify it for, for a couple of minutes, but it was fun though. It was fun to see, but anyways, all right, everyone, thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. Um, we will be back next week. Uh, I believe next week we're going to do our part two of our series on uh, on building our business and, and what that took and kind of giving people the insights into that. Um, and maybe, maybe it's the week after I have to check the editorial calendar. But anyways, thank you all. And we hope you all have a great week. <laughs>